Hello. Uh, my name is Peter Lundberg, and I'm a head of operations of the Asia Pacific Urban, Urban Association in Bangkok. Uh, I'm happy to be here in Hong Kong today to this talk to talk about multi energy systems uh, for cities, sustainable cities in a the Asia Pacific. Uh, the energy consumption in cities is a vital. Uh, cities occupy only 2% of the world's landmass, but they consume two-thirds of the world's energy. Cities account for more than 70% of the global CO2 emissions. And in the beginning of the 20th century, 15% uh, of the world's population lived in cities. Uh, this number uh, increased to 30% by 1950. Today, 58% of the global population lives in cities. And this percentage is expected to grow to 68% in 2050. And this rapid urbanization has led to the growth of mega cities or urban agglomerations with more than 10 million in inhabitants. And today there are 33 mega cities worldwide where and 17 of those megacities are in Asia Pacific. Um, and in 2030, there will this number expected to reach 43 globally, and 25 of those uh, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, looking into the solutions for energy systems in cities, one has to consider consider the sectoral energy consumption for the specific cities because they 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 are quite different depending on in each city, depending on the climate and the econo the economic environment and so forth. For example, the largest energy consuming sector in Hong Kong is the commercial sector, stands for, which stands for forty two percent. In Bangkok, is transportation sector stands for for seventy five four percent of the total energy consumptions. Uh, in Tokyo, the commercial sector stands for 36% of the energy consumption. And in Osaka, the, the industrial sector stands for 41% of the energy consumption. Uh, and to be sustainable, uh, uh, urban energy systems must meet several, uh, some several um, needs uh, to handle the growth of the economy and the population and also create a city that is livable including mobility health and safety um, yes i want to share uh, a little bit about energy consumption in buildings building stands for 30 percent of the final energy consumption in the asia pacific and they also uh, accounts for a large part of greenhouse gas emissions in cities. For example, in Hong Kong, our buildings account for 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions. In New York, that number is 70%. In Tokyo, that number is 40%. That is for the commercial sector. Space cooling is the fastest growing uh, use of energy in buildings, and it cooling accounted for about 19% of the total electricity used in buildings. And this number was 13% in the 1990s. So it's a big, quite a big shift there. What is multi-energy systems? Uh, well, you can say the modern sustainable urban energy systems generally are in integrated multi-fueled energy systems that incorporate energy efficiency, renewable energy, and the mod side management. And different, the, ex, here are some examples of concepts of multi energy systems. Hope, what did I do? Um, here are some concepts of multi energy systems district energy, including district heating and district cooling, also combined heating and cooling, smart grids. Uh, Distributed energy, including cogeneration, combined heating and power, and tri-generation, combined cooling and heat and power. So, and the benefits uh, they have, advan the, their advantages over traditional energy systems are that they, they 
they are adaptable to changes in fuel availability. They are more effective to utilize low low value surplus energy and renewable energy. They are they allows for flexible integration of intermittent renewable energy through energy storage and co and tri generation and also the reduction of peak loads. I, I want to discuss uh, a little bit more about district energy. Um, district energy systems are increasingly climate resilient and low carbon, allowing for up to 50% less energy consumption for heating and cooling. Um, the district energy systems uh, allow for the recovery and distribution of surplus and low-grade heat, heat and cold to end users. For example, waste heat from industries, power stations, waste incinerations, sewage treatment, or, or also cooling from water bodies, LNG terminals, and you can also use waste heat to drive absorption chillers uh, to produce district cooling. Um, one example of a combination of this is in a city in Sweden, Västerås, where the district heating system is basically fueled by uh, waste to energy plant. Uh, so by burning incinerating waste, you produce uh, electricity and district heating. At the same time, they have a district cooling network using absorption chillers. Uh, so the actually the district the um, the chillers, absorption chillers, are driven by the district heating network, thus uh, giving uh, a, the best utilization of fuel as possible. District energy um, can store large amounts of energy at low cost, for example, solar heat for use during the winter, or, or the conversion of sur surplus renewable power uh, into, heat into heating or cooling for use during peak demand. Uh, district energy system also uh, allows the integration and balan balancing of large shares of variable renewable power on el electricity grids through thermal storage and cogeneration heat pumps. District energy systems is a fast and cost uh, transition to sustainable refrigerants compliant with the Kigali amendment to the Pro uh, Montreal Protocol and compared to competitive technologies, they are more cost effective by up to 50% compared to individual buildings produ producing their own cooling uh, in areas where there is a sufficient energy demand or the energy dis uh, uh, density is efficient. Um, I w another example of uh, combined heating cooling recovery is use we well today we talk a lot about data and IoT and the cost for for uh, collecting data and al analyzing data is growing really fast and so the data centers are being being built in a rapid uh, phase and one to use um, the waste energy the waste heat produced by the data center is to uh, connect the data centers to the district heating network. And this is done in Stockholm, where there has been a pilot project uh, allowing for data centers and other uh, heat providers to connect to the district heating network. So for data centers, they uh, basically use a chiller to produce the cooling needed for the data center and use the, the district heating network as a heat sink allowing for the data the data center company to s actually sell their waste heat back to the grid to the district heating uh, utility company and the benefit for the utility company is that they they have the possibility to get um, heating capacity in places where they didn't have any production heating production before so it actually is a win-win for everyone. I also want to talk about district cooling and how it's, it is an important technology 
to mitigate climate change. Uh, first, my first, firstly, the, the growing demand for cooling is driven by economic population growth, economic and population growth in the in the hottest part of the world, and the IEA projects that the lion's share of the projected growth in the energy used for space cooling by 2050 comes from just from emerging countries, with just three countries, China, India, and Indonesia, standing uh, contribut contributing to half of the global cooling energy demand growth. Um, so, district cooling can reduce energy consumption up to 50% by using en uh, energy more, uh, more uh, efficiently. And c current cooling technologies, such as air conditioning and refrigeration, rely on human-made uh, uh, fluoride gases which are almost 10,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide and in causing global warming. And if we do nothing, these gases could account for nearly 20% of climate pollution by 2050. So uh, the, the best chance to avoid this uh, runaway warming is to act uh, quickly to reduce highly potent but uh, short-lived climate pollutants including me methane, ozone, and hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, and black carbon. At, and at the same time, uh, cut down on CO2 emissions, which is a long-lived greenhouse gas. So, if we take fast and immediate action uh, on these short-lived climate pollutants, we can, uh, we can avoid over half a degree of warming by 2050. And another half a degree can be avoided by energy efficiency improvements. So the total po potential for the cooling sector is actually one degree Celsius. And district cooling is recognized by the UN to have a key role to meet both of these targets and as a solution for up to 25% of the global cooling demand. One interesting, very interesting project, district cooling project is actually here in Hong Kong, is at the Kai Tak Development Zone. It's the first of its kind in Hong Kong, and it was chosen because it was the most efficient air conditioning system that was suitable for the area. The capacity is 280 megawatts, and the system connects 50 consuming buildings. Uh, it's expected to be 35% more efficient than air-cooled air conditioning systems, and the calculated annual, annual savings are 80 million kilowatt hour. The cost for the consumer is comparable to uh, water uh, to water-cooled AC systems using cooling towers, and the cost recovery is expected to be 30 years. Um, and this is a very big uh, project, and comparing to other big district cooling networks, um, the, the district cooling system in Stockholm has a capacity of 350 megawatts. The district cooling system in Paris has a capacity of 30, 30, 330 megawatts and the district cooling uh, system in Helsinki has a capacity of 150 megawatts. Challenges and opportunities for district energy. The opportunities is that uh, they allow for increased energy efficiency by 25 to 50% and improved environmental efficiency. They have a long lifespan up to 50 years low maintenance cost and improved uh, management. Uh, district Energy has getting increased public and governmental awareness due to global in initiatives such as the UN District Energy in Cities Initiative and also from our association. Uh, there are a wide range of suitable technologies for projects, for District Energy projects that all have different preconditions. There's a huge market potential. 
not the least for central district areas, industries, airports, hospitals, and data centers. It's a recognized energy supply concept globally, and there are available financing and business models. So challenges and lessons learned. Uh, there are many buzzwords and terms you used for district energy. Uh, so it has to be, uh, sometimes it's believed that a district energy system is always for the solution for a big city, the whole city. But in reality, uh, this district energy system can be both small and large. And they are very, and and they are, have to be adapted to the local conditions in in in, e in each project. There are different regulatory difference uh, in 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 different markets, both for district heating and cooling. There's a geographic diversity, so there are different uh, due to different climate and economy in different cities. Uh, each um, project is has to be adapted to local conditions. There's a need for cross-sectoral planning as these district energy projects are infrastructure projects. Uh, you need to involve local governments, utilities, developers, landowners. Everyone has to work together uh, to plan for uh, district energy projects. The district energy projects have high initial cost. These are fro front-loaded investments. There's a lack of in incentives and regulations. Uh, and wh what's also needed is customer protection in terms of pricing and quality of service so that the customer will ha pay a, 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 a good price and will get the service he paid for. Uh, there, also, there are also experience gaps along the project value chain and all of the parts of a project is important as if one part fails um, it can lead to the failure of the whole system or it will not live up to the expectation that w w which will actually um, ruin the project. Uh, there's a problem uh, challenge with delayed ro load ramp up and occupation rate ratio which leads to slower payback rate uh, rate of the project and this is uh, extra important because these projects have high initial costs. So the Asia Pacific Urban Energy Association uh, is, an, uh, is an initiative by the International Institute for Energy Conservation and was launched in July 2017 uh, supported by the U Euro Heat and Power and Danish Border District Heating. Similar associations exist in uh, North America and Europe, but none in Asia Pacific. And uh, the IIEC was, has been approached by development agencies and industry stakeholders to host this, such an association. Our mission is to actively promote the development of sustainable urban energy in the Asia Pacific region and to be a platform to convene cross sectoral stakeholders focusing on sustainable urban energy to promote market development and share global and regional experience and best practices and support su sustainable urban energy development uh, uh, alliances. Uh, we have six tracks at the moment, district energy, smart grids, energy storage, renewable energy and energy efficiency, consumers and prosumers, financing policies and regulatory frameworks. And our ge geographical focus is East Asia, China, Jap Japan, and Korea, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. We provide our members with uh, newsletters. We have a port uh, online portal, uh, online portal, our website, uh, where our members can access uh, news trends and reports, statistics, for example. We produce a quarterly magazine where we collect uh, and and write interesting articles from our members and, and other invi invitees. I have a few copies actually here today, so if you would like one, uh, you can uh, approach me later and I can give you, give you one. Um, we, we, will al we also produce other publications. Um, we 
invite our members to regional and international events in Asia-Pacific countries, including our annual general meeting. We provide direct assistance, and active members can have a vote in our the governance of the association. S yes, uh, since we started almost two years ago, we have collected 24 members, and our founding members are ABB and, G and Johnson Controls. And this year we will focus a lot on events. Uh, and so we will either uh, uh, support, participate, or host 12 uh, events, in the re mostly in the Asia-Pacific region during uh, 2019. So if you have any questions about the benefits, about being a member, how to become a member, or any of our events, you can please Talk to me whenever you have this opportunity. We are also interested to uh, if to share interesting articles, e both our, uh, in our magazine or and our online uh, platforms. We w we reach out. We have a network that we reach out to about ten thousand uh, individuals uh, through our marketing channels. So that's all for me. Thank you very much.